Hello, everyone. Welcome to CCJA Sundays. My name is Camila Vitaitis, and I'm with the Colorado Conservatory for the Jazz Arts. And a huge thanks to Colin Stranahan, who helps curate this series. He is also an alum of CCJA, and it's really awesome that we've been able to connect with so many amazing people, thanks to Colin. Um, and tonight is no exception. I'm very thrilled to be interviewing saxophonist Joel Fromm. Hi, Joel. Hello. Hey, Camila. How's it going? Good. I'm great. I'm 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 in in my I'm at my parents' place in West Hartford, Connecticut, right now. Hi. What's it like there right now? Very hot. <laughs> it's very hot here too. I think that's the general vibe these days. Yeah, it's it's there's a heat wave going on all over all over the land. So yeah. And are you fully vaccinated and everything? I am. I am. Hey. I'm fully vaxxed, as they say. Yes, awesome. I'm fully vaxxed. Cool. Yeah. Well, that's awesome. Do you think you're going to be have some opportunities to get out there and play some more now that things are opening up? Well, I already I already do. Um, I'm right. actually I'm headed out. Um, well, actually, tomorrow I'm going to New York City to the cutting room. I'm I'm recording a, a video with the great uh, uh, Italian guitarist pa uh, Pasquale Grasso. Cool. Um, we're doing something at the cutting room that's going to be recorded for later. And then uh, in a couple of days on Thursday, I fly out to Cincinnati to play uh, Cafe Vivace in Cincinnati with. Um, with uh, Steve, the organist Steve Schmidt and um, uh, Jeff Hamilton on drums. So we're going right. to do an organ trio gig out there for a couple nights. So, and then later in the year, I'm playing Vail Jazz Festival again um, with my quartet. And so, yeah, it's, it's starting to, you know, starting to really open up at this point. And, and, and it's nice that some work is coming in. It's been, you know, a long time coming. So. Cool. Well, I would love to hear a little bit about like what your last year has been like. I know maybe that's kind of a sad subject to start with but if, if i could hear about your pandemic experience and how it affected your artistry sure well you know like i think like most people it kind of blindsided me i i didn't realize um i didn't i i knew you know when we started reading about this thing covid in the in the paper and started hearing about it um you know i actually had one, i had one friend uh john rogers who's a great photographer and works at the village vanguard at the door at the vanguard um, he, um, he was the one person on Facebook saying, get ready. <laughs> and everyone else is like, ah, it'll be, it'll pass, you know, and, and he was right. And, and so what, what ended up happening for me, I got lucky because, uh, I came off the road. I had just played in Memphis and little rock, Arkansas. And I, and then I went to smalls for, uh, two or three nights. And right before everything sh shut down, I got COVID. I, I, I caught it. And, and so I had it, um, for the entire month of April of last year, basically, and it was, I was really, really sick. I, I, I luck, luckily I didn't have to go to the hospital. Um, I, I know I have friends that actually, you know, had to be on ventilators and luckily survived. And, um, but yeah, it's really just such a terrible thing for all, all of us, all of us concerned. And, and, um, I mean, I feel fortunate that I made it through with my health and really no, no lasting symptoms. Um, but, uh, but we're, I, I, but of course, work wise, um, I ended up, you know, actually giving up my place in New York city because there was just no work to be had for, for the whole year. So it was the first time in 31 years that I didn't live in New York city. Um, and I came up to my folks place in January and I've been up here ever since. And, and of course now I'm moving to uh, Nashville in July, but, but as far as, yeah, as far as what happened, you know, for the whole year, um, in a way, I mean, it was it's it's been just terribly sad, obviously, for the entire nation and for the entire world to see so many people, you know, that it's affected, and also so many people who've died from it. Um, I think personally, I've really tried to make as much positivity out of it as I can. I've been focusing on my music. I'm getting this new record out, um, you know, so I I finished mixing and mastering and and talking to my record label and also um you know just been exercising and eating right and you know kind of doing what i can to utilize this time in a positive way so i mean i guess maybe it's a little bit of a paradox but in a, in a you know as as awful as this year has been for for everybody i've really kind of tried to spin it and use this time wisely and and uh, and so actually in, you know ironically i'm i feel like i'm in a better place now just personally than I have been in many many years um and maybe this was in a way it was maybe it was sort of an opportunity having all of this free time to um to kind of focus on my mental and physical health and and just um and do that so I feel really good I feel like my playing is strong now the, the few times that I've been able to play with other people um also what happens I think for many of us musicians and maybe for many other people too just getting back to work at what you do um feels like a blessing and feels like a privilege all of a sudden 
you know, I think before the pandemic hit, you know, I would be on tour and be like, oh, yeah, that was, that was a nice tour. And that, that was a nice gig. And you kind of just pass it, pass it by and you wouldn't think about it anymore. Uh, but for the past couple of months, I've had two or three gigs for the first time in a year. And every gig just seems like um, very precious all of a sudden and, and feels, um, you know, the, like you really feel the gratitude of, of being able to play with other people and just be with other people. Um, I really feel that deeply. Um, and so, you know, I guess that's the, maybe that's the bright spot to all of this. Maybe that's the bright side to all of this, that, that, um, it's, um, you know, it, maybe it, it will wake people up to the things that are important and, and, uh, you know, bring people together. I've also, I've also gotten to really be with my family a lot. I've gotten to be around my mom and dad for, you know, uh, in, a, in an extended and, and intense way for in, in a way that I haven't ever really in my adult life. So that's been actually a, a real blessing too, just yeah. to be around them and have that family experience with them has been, been fantastic. So, um, yeah. so that's, that's my take on, you know, on sort of the last year. Totally. I think I can relate certainly to like, despite how difficult it was kind of coming out like a better version of myself than I have been in a long time. I think it gave yeah. all, all of us the space we needed to, reflect and work on what we wanted to work on and yeah I think that's awesome yeah I, d I definitely looked at it as an opportunity uh for growth and and uh and I think I when, when I talk to friends and other musicians too I think they felt the same way that a lot of people are just you know they're trying to be as creative as, as possible and I've seen a lot of new music coming out a lot of people are writing you know people are coming out with projects I mean it's it's I think there's going to be you're going to see a real uh if not an explosion a real wave of of music coming out um you know, after this really starts getting going again with the, with the live performing, I think you're going to see a lot of really good music coming. So, yeah. And speaking of music coming up, you have a release coming out on the 25th this month called The Bright Side. Right. It's trio with Dan Loomis and Ernesto Servini. Right. And could you talk a little bit about that project and when you recorded, how it came about? All that. Sure. Um, well, the, the, the band came together because um, yeah, I had been playing in Ernesto's sextet called Turbo Prep. It's a mostly a Canadian band, but uh, Dan and I are the Americans in that band, but the rest are all Canadian. We would tour Canada. Uh, Ernesto is always, you know, uh, hustling Canada Council grants. And so we've done a few tours of Canada. Um, and there was one tour of Canada about three, maybe two or three years ago, where um, the University of Toronto asked me just as a soloist to be to do a master class. And so um, I could have done it solo. But then I, I asked, you know, the guys were already up there. I said, Hey, Dan and Ernesto, you want to you want to at least accompany me as a trio for this master class? And they did. And immediately after the class, they actually came up to me and I had a great time with it. I, I mean, I always have a great time playing playing with them. But uh, they came up to me, they said, Man, would you like to play with this trio just as a trio again? I said, Yeah, of course. And so the, to try and make a long story a little shorter, um, those guys booked on their own a European tour under my name. Uh, and we ended up uh, going out uh, for about 14 days, maybe a little less than that. But we went to uh, Tbilisi, Georgia, where I've never been before. We, we played in France. We played uh, in um, Helsinki, I think. And, and uh, you know, at some I forget where exactly where else we went, but... Um, but it was this really, really good tour. And, and also on the tour, I got inspired and I started writing a lot. I, I actually wrote seven tunes on, on tour while I, while I was in, you know, on ferries and on planes and I would just, you know, write one and we'd play it the next night. And then I'd write another one and we played it the next night. And so by the time the tour was over, I had this whole book that I had written for, for the band and we had played it a lot on the road. Um, and so I just felt like a natural thing to do to schedule that that studio time right away after that. And so we we went in the studio, we recorded it, we got the rough rough mixes down. And then, you know, I was, you know, on the verge of mastering it and then the virus hit and then and so that that sort of sidetracked it. Um but uh but then, you know, once once it became possible to to actually send the rough rough mix back to mastering, we it's uh, sort of the ball got rolling again and now it's, you know, finally finally co coming out. So I'm I'm very very pleased about that because it's really the first record there's seven, I think there's seven of my compositions and three from, from the other guys. And um, I'm very proud of, it's the first record that I've ever put out that's uh, entirely original material, entirely new music by, by everybody. So I, I feel really, really good about that. I feel like it's the most personal music that I've ever put out there. Um, and uh, yeah, I feel pretty strongly about it. I, I like the record and, and I'm anxious for people to, people to hear it. Yeah, I know. We're all really excited to hear it. Do you think you're going to tour with that band? 
we're working on it. Um, yeah, there's, uh, I know that Dan and Ernesto are working on like just a short, maybe United States Midwest slash West tour, I think for the fall or there were just like five, five or six days for that. And then they're working on a Europe, European jaunt, like I think next April, April or something like that. I forget. March. Make April. sure Denver's on that list for the Western tour. Well, yeah, you know, I, yeah, actually that's, that's true. I, I I'm, I'm certainly going to be talking to them about where we're going before we go. So we're at, we're actually still, still kind of booking some of that stuff. So hopefully, you know, we'll get a chance to come out there. So. Oh yeah. We all hope so. Yeah. Um, could you talk a little bit about like what it, what it's like to play in a cordless trio and like what are opportunities that presents as a soloist and maybe having the harmony more open, like what, how the responsibilities shift a little bit about that? Sure. Um, well, you know, it's interesting because it's that format, the, the, the saxophone uh, trio without a chordal instrument accompanying um, has been a favorite for me uh, and really uh, a huge influence for me from the very first time I started, you know, really studying jazz because my, one of my first teachers uh, was this great saxophonist, Tom Christensen. And when I was 17, I went up to Eastman uh, School of Music summer camp for about six weeks and I was studying with him. And he was the first person to tell me, hey, I want you to transcribe solos and memorize solos. And I said, OK. He said, well, there's, there's this, the first one he gave me, he said, there's this great Sonny Rollins record, uh, A Night at the Village Vanguard. And um, I said, OK, great. He said, I want you to write down the way Sonny plays the melody and the solo, his improvisation on Soft Leaves and Morning Sunrise. Um, and so I did. I, I wrote down the way Sonny played the melody and I wrote down his solo. And then I started listening to the rest of that record and I absolutely fell in love. I mean, you know, at, at age 17, I, 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 had, I had listened to, you know, Charlie Parker. I'd listened to like, you know, Mike Brecker. I'd listened to a lot of, you know, Coltrane and a few things, but there was a lot of, a lot of gaps in my knowledge. And it, when I heard Sonny Rollins and I heard that record, um, I was just so enthralled by hearing this guy with such incredible rhythm and harmony in this stark setting and and wilbur ware is so incredible on that record and elvin jones i mean it's just it's very very swinging and it's very earthy mm -hmm. there's something something very earthy about about that sound um you know those guys are not trying to be slick and perfect they're they're just it's really um it's really compelling because there's just a lot of guts to it um and and the way sonny utilizes the space it's almost like he he can take on so many different roles because there is so much space. You know, he can take on the role of a drummer. He can take on the role of an accompanist when when the other guys are playing. Um, you know, it really does allow for this huge canvas, this huge sonic canvas that you can that you can fill how you wish. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's always appealed to me. And, and then of course after that, I discovered you know Ernest Coleman Quartet with with Don Cherry and you know Billy Higgins or Ed Blackwell and you know Charlie Hayden and those guys. Um, and that was a whole other would take on it you know where um I, one of my favorite records became ornette on tenor it's one of the one of the only tenor records that you'll ever hear ornette coleman play and it just that blew my mind i mean hearing ornette coleman to play tenor uh with with, uh, with ed blackwell i was just like i was like what is this this is a whole it's almost like listening to jackson pollock on tenor saxophone you know it really i really i that's the that's the sort of the the um analogy i make with people because when you listen to ornette it's like He's breaking free of all of the constraints of, of the ex expected, uh, uh, you know, bebop, cliche, whatever you want to call it. He's, he, he just exploded that on, on those records. So, so I find, anyway, this is a very long-winded answer to your question, but, but I, I just, I'm, so, I'm so compelled um, by the way different uh, trios deal with that space because there's so many possibilities. It's so open. Um, you know, if you listen to say Warren Marsh play trio, as opposed to Ornette playing trio, as opposed to Sonny Rollins playing trio, as opposed to like Jimmy Jufri playing trio, or, or there's so many different examples of that type of playing that um, it's uh, and Joe Henderson playing trio for that matter. Um, that there, it's it's really I, I just I just find it to be a very wide canvas and and very very compelling way uh, uh, format to play in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I'm really looking forward to hearing that release. Just as a reminder for everyone, that's on June 25th. Um, so we're all going to be in, um, in anticipation of that release. And I guess kind of to stay on this topic, um, I wanted to ask you about duo playing as well, because that's something like I've worn out the Brad Meldau <laughs> duo record, Don't Explain, and um, especially the Beatles tune. I was like on repeat in my head, you know. Yeah. You talk about your approach to playing duo and maybe 
things you appreciate from someone that you're playing duo with? Sure. Well, you know, actually, it's funny you mentioned that because I, I was I was thinking about it the other day. I was I was looking at that record. Um, I hadn't thought about it in a while, and and I thought, man, when was that that we were in the studio? And I and I looked. And it's going to be 20 years in December since wow. I recorded that record. I was like, no way, man. I can't believe it's 20 years ago. And I remember that day so, so clearly. But yeah, uh, certainly I've done a lot of duo playing. Um, you know, with, with I, I, that connection with Brad is very, very heavy for me because we, you know, really grew up together. And, you know, we went to high school together and we discovered a lot of that music together. You know, listened to Bud Powell and Bird and 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 uh, Coltrane and discovered Wayne Shorter together and Mingus together. And, you know, he taught me about like art rock. He was into General Giant. He was into Hendrix and, you know, he was into the Grateful Dead. And so, you know, he 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 had all of these other influences that I wasn't aware of that that we we also share. So um, and uh, the story, the story behind actually that Beatles song, which is Mother Nature's Son, um, which is on the White Album, um, and uh, was that I went to see Brad play solo. Um, I believe it was at Symphony Space in, in Manhattan, and he he would do these incredible solo shows. And that particular night, he he had that he had that arrangement, you know, before I had ever heard it before. He was he was playing that arrangement of Mother Nature's Son, and I just I saw it for the first time, and I thought to myself, man, I. I have to once for once in my life, I have to play that arrangement with him because it just tore my heart out. I was just like, my God, that's so beautiful. Um, and so I asked him, you know, I, when we were planning on this, right, I said, man, would you mind if we did that song? He's like, yeah, of course we could play that arrangement. And it turned out to be something very, very special. Um, but uh, to, you know, to address your question, I, you know, playing duo with different people, you know, I guess, I guess if there's one thing I'm, I'm proud of in my musical, in my, my musicianship is that I feel like I'm able to um, really meet people on their own terms. And, and I think that you have to, you know, I, for me, that's, that's a, a, a strong point, I think, is, is if you can, um, you know, sort of absorb and, and understand where another musician is coming from. And, you know, some musicians are very busy, some musicians are very sparse. Some are very boisterous, some are very, you know, recessive, some are, you know, so there's, you know, some are very humorous, some are very dour, <laughs> you know, so there's all, there's always these kind of opposite opposites going on. And I try to engage those things. Like if I, if I, I'm always asking myself, I'm not asking myself verbally, but I'm asking myself subconsciously, what does the music need right now? Um, you know, if I'm playing with a person and they're, and they have a lot going on, I know that if I'm if I add a lot, it's not going to make a lot of sense to create like chaos. So so I'm often I'm often looking to play the foil, to play the straight man. You know, it's like I always think of the great com comic duos. You think about Abbott and Costello or Lauren and Hardy. There's always like a funny guy and a straight man. You know, and so if someone's off being funny or off being verbose, I'm going to be the guy that offsets it by being simpler, um, or vice versa. So. Um, so that that's I think that's a really important sort of more grand view on my philosophy of playing not just duo but playing in bands in general is to ask you know what can I do to um, to augment this music and to create something greater than the sum of its parts because I think jazz musicians you know the idea of improvisation is great but but it also has pitfalls I think sometimes jazz has aired on the side of, of indulgence, um, that, that sometimes you hear, um, even, you know, a lot of my favorite modern musicians, which I won't name, but I, but I was listening to radio the other day and I'm, and I, and, and all these great virtuoso, virtuoso peers of mine. And it was great. It was really interesting, but I was thinking to myself, man, this would be better if everyone just kind of chilled out for a minute, you know, and, 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 you know, and just, and just like use some more space and, and listen to one another more. Um, so I, I, you know, that's, that's kind of a tall order and it takes years, I think, to really develop that sense of, of, of e economy and, and, and sort of grace and, and, uh, you know, uh, shutting your mouth and opening up your ears more. And, you know, that's, that's sort of what I'm trying to strive for now is, is trying to be more graceful and more eloquent in my playing than, than I, than I was before. As, as I get older, I want to play less. And as I get older, I love Lester Young more. So I think there's a connection there somehow. Yeah. Do you have like a musical setting where you feel like the most at home or is it all kind of just there's a few, um, you know, you know, pertaining to we were talking about this trio setting, you know, I played for uh, about six or seven years at this place, the bar next door or uh, the restaurant was La Lanterna on McDougal Street with uh, and the, the house band was me and Joe Martin on bass and Bill Campbell on drums. And, um, you know, 
when you play with a band, any band for that long, you really do develop a simpatico feeling that, that, uh, you can't get any other way. So, so certainly with guys like that, or, uh, you know, also Matt Wilson is another person who I feel a real connection with, obviously Brad Meldow, David Berkman, um, you know, there are certain people that have been really important, um, you know, uh, collaborators with me, Jay Monheit. I was in her band for four years and we developed a, a really tight, uh, vocal, uh, tenor vocal saxophone relationship where we were almost had this ESP, uh, together, uh, on gigs. Um, so yeah, there's something very valuable about that when you have those kind of relationships that develop over time. So those are some of the, some of the musical relationships that I really treasure. Um, also being in Freddie Cole's band, Freddie Cole just passed, um, about a year, uh, how long has it been? Almost a year ago, maybe. Um, and, um, you know, learning from Freddie and being in that band and playing with him so much, uh, was also, an, it was another way of, of engaging, um, a, a player and, and kind of learning, um, how to exist in his world and 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 that and that that created some real depth after a while too so those are some of the people that i would say that i really are in my wheelhouse if you want to say that like that that i really feel i feel like i'm in the groove with those people yeah. um you know there's ari honig is another one um there's you know uh, brian blade is another one i mean who doesn't love brian blade but i mean you know you, you get you get the point so there's there there are many um joe martin um you know uh, ugano okegwo anthony Pensiati, omer avital um many 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 so cool um well I, I guess it's kind of related um but i was wondering if you could talk a little bit about like the difference between being a band leader and being a side man and how to be <laughs> like what what you have to do to be good in at viewing both situations when you're a band leader you pay money <laughs> right <laughs> no that's uh, the start. <laughs> yeah that's 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 one thing you do as a band leader no i i, I think um you know, I, I was always much more of a sideman for many, many years. And I, and I, you know, the only leader stuff that I really did for, for the most part for, for a long, long time, uh, was I was making records. Um, but I, but I would rarely kind of tour these records. They were, they were sort of one-off records and, and they were good records, but, but I, I never had the opportunity really to be a touring leader, um, until more recently. Um, and, you know, I think, I think as a, as a sideman, it's easier because the, in a way the, the pressure is off. You're not, you know, you're not, you're not, you're, you're not having to worry about eight different issues at the same time and, and worrying about, you know, making sure that your sidemen are happy and making sure that everything is, 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 uh, copacetic in the, in the, in the greater situation. So, um, yeah, it's a different, you know, it's, it's a different feeling. I, I mean, I always feel like I play better when I'm a sideman because I'm not worried about anything. You know? mm -hmm. When you're a leader and you go in and it's your music and you're thinking about a million different things and you're thinking, Oh God, is this taking to be okay? And then you don't play as well because you're, you're preoccupied with all that stuff. So the trick is to get really good enough to, um, you know, at, at leading where you, it becomes as natural as being a sideman. And that, that takes, that takes time, you know, it, it takes time, but, but also I think it, it's like anything else you get better as you practice. I mean, I, I admire the leaders, um, that have really developed even more so than their improvisational prowess. I, I admire the leaders that have really, uh, uh dedicated themselves to being great composers. Mm -hmm. And that's why I admire like, you know, Kurt Rosenwinkel and Omer Avital and, and, uh, you know, there's some, uh, Guillermo Klein is another person who I really admire Maria Schneider um you know of jeff watts and man check out jeff watts's quartet jeff watts you know quiet as it's kept everyone thinks about jeff watts as being this great drummer which he is but man jeff watts is a great composer i mean really great composer every time i would go to see jeff watts play at the vanguard with his quartet he would blow me away because and it wasn't even just the playing it was like the fact that he would write these really catchy tunes and th things that you would go home singing afterwards and it, i mean i i really value that i i really admire that um you know, I went to see Rachel Z the other day, I, a duo. It was one of the first time, first music that I saw uh, post pan. Well, it's not really post pandemic, but now that things are opening, opening up, I went to Mesero and I was, I happened to be there. I was playing Smalls right before that. And I went to see Matt Penman and Rachel Z play duo at Mesero. And just hearing Rachel's tunes, you know, I mean, I hadn't seen Rachel play in years and, and hearing her songs was just so refreshing. I said, man, she's writing great, you know, just these really beautiful things. Um, so I have a real uh, admiration for, um, 
uh, you know, some of these, some of these players, there's actually another, there's also, um, a great young woman who's playing saxophone, uh, African-American, actually, I don't know if she's African-American, she might actually be African, that was at the new school, who I just heard on the radio, and I'm trying to remember her name, um, it's, it's like Linda S with an S, and it's a long last name, and I can't think of her, Sik Sikhan, Sikhan, something, anyway, uh, that's terrible, I'm butchering her name, She's amazing. You know, I heard her on the radio the other day. I'm, Who is this? You know, this person is amazing and she's writing great stuff and she's playing great. You know, it's uh, and so I, um, I I really admire those people who are following their vision. You know, Melissa Aldana is another person. I mean, there's so many, so many great, great people out there. Mark Turner, you know, I can't I, I just could go on and on and on. I don't want to just make this about a litany of jazz musicians, but I, I really I'm, I'm in love with all these people because I just love what they do. So yeah, totally. Well, maybe like a crazy segue. We kind of touched on this when you talked about um, how you and Brad Meldow grew up together, but I was thinking maybe we could go even further back. And could you talk about like how you initially got into music and like what sparked, what inspired you? Sure. Um, my, my parents told a story. I, I don't remember this at all, but, but my parents told a story that I, I went to a Christmas party with friends of theirs and, uh, you know, apparently what happened is that they had the Vince Guaraldi Christmas record on and I heard it and there was a piano there and I, and I went over the piano and I started trying to play, you know, the melodies from, from the record. I was, I guess, five or something like that. And, and, and I, I mean, this is a very vague memory for me, but then I know that I begged my parents for a piano um, after that and they, they got an upright piano and I started taking piano lessons from when I was five. And of course, like most kids, like, you know, I didn't really want to practice, you know, I just wanted to play and, and I would drive my teachers nuts because I would just do everything by ear and I wouldn't really read the music. I would just kind of learn it, learn it by ear and play it by, from memory. So I was, I was, I ended up making always the same mistakes all the time because I wasn't reading the page, you know, all that stuff. So, um, but I, but I did have some, you know, some, uh, natural, I don't know, inclination towards this. So. Um, as I got older, uh, you know, and, and they started having, you know, band class in fourth and fifth grade, I tried a bunch of different instruments. I played flute, I played bassoon, I played French horn. Um, I tried a lot of different things and nothing really stuck. But then my best friend in eighth grade uh, is, is, is still a friend of mine. His name is uh, Giovanni Washington Wright. And he's in Texas now, but we were in Racine, Wisconsin together. And he said, man, why don't you try out for the eighth grade jazz band? You know, why don't you ask, you know, because we were, he was playing saxophone and I, I heard saxophone in all the, like the pop hits of the day, like men at work had saxophone in it, you know, stuff like that. And so I, I heard, um, you know, I knew the kind of pop saxophone vibe. And so I went up to the band director. I said, I want to play, I want to play, uh, sax. I think I said, I want to play soprano saxophone in the band. And he laughed at me. He was like, we don't have any soprano saxophone charts for you to play, but, but uh, here, why don't you try this tenor saxophone? And so I, he said, go in the closet. He did. He's like, go in the closet and figure it out. That was his advice. <laughs> so he gave me a tenor said, go in the closet and figure it out. Okay. So, so I, that was in Racine. And then the, the short story is that my, my dad, who was a journalist and was writing for the Racine Journal Times, ended up getting a job in, West, in Hartford, Connecticut at the Hartford Current, which is where they still reside in West Hartford. Um, and I, I ended up transferring in the middle of my freshman year of high school to um, Hall High School in West Hartford, which is, you know, has become this kind of famous place that um, has produced just a, many, many great jazz musicians and professional jazz musicians, including, you know, Erica von Kleist and Noah Preminger and Pat Zimmerly and Brad and myself and uh, um, Richie Barche and just, I mean, it's, there's like a long, long, uh, Pete McGinnis, there's a long list of, of all of us that have gone through um, that, um, that, that school. So um, it's, uh, it was very lucky for me. It was like hitting the lottery, you know, and, and when, on my 16th birthday, the, the entire high school big band got together and bought me six jazz LPs on my, on my 16th birthday during a rehearsal which blew me away. And it was like all, you know, Miles Davis and Art Blakey and Phil Woods. And, you know, I mean, all the stuff that you want a young jazz musician to hear, they went, they went out and they were thoughtful enough to get this incredible birthday present for me. You know, all this is pre CDs. It was records, you know, which is awesome. So, um, and I wore those records out. I dropped the needle on all those records. I learned the solos on all of those records. I could, I could probably still sing you all the melodies and the solos from that, from those records, um, including the one that I love. I, I, they're one of the, my favorite ones was hearing Miles Davis play Supposin, which is on the new, the new Miles Davis quintet with Philly Joe Jones. And it's like very, I think it's very early Coltrane on that record. It's one of the, one of his first ones. 
And I used to get so obsessed with just hearing Miles, Miles play the melody. I would, I would listen to Miles play the melody. I had all of all, of, I transferred all of it onto cassette. I would push play, listen to Miles play the melody, stop. And through his break, stop, rewind. Push play, <laughs> listen to Miles play the melody again, stop, rewind. And I would just, I couldn't get past the melody because the melody was so great that I just, I, and so I would just end up singing this, the way Miles played melodies over and over again. Um, so I, obviously you can tell from the way I'm talking about all this stuff that I fell deeply in love with the music, like to an obsessive point. Um, you know, I remember the first day I heard Charlie Parker and, and people talk about a religious experience. They had people having a re religious experience. I got religion the day I, I heard Charlie Parker. Um, you know, a, an older student, uh, Pat Zimmerly said, you know, I was carrying around the Charlie Parker, Parker Omni book, which is filled with Charlie Parker transcriptions. And he said, have you listened to Charlie Parker? I said, no, I was kind of sheep. No, I haven't listened. He said, go to the library. There's a cassette with all of those solos on it that I made, you know, go check it out. And so I did. And I, I went, I went back home and I put it in my little Walkman, you know, put it in the cassette Walkman and push play. And, and, uh, I actually have my, so I, I can actually demonstrate. So the first thing that comes into my ears is you know it's it's kim that's the song kim and and uh and as soon as i heard him start playing that um i was just like i had to grab the edges of the bed i was like oh my god who is this guy and how do i do that i need to do that i need to know what that is i mean immediately i was just i was gone i was like i need to know so i i, st I started obsessively practicing charlie parker lines um, and I did that a lot in high school. Um, and I was just learning language, you know, I mean, between listening with Brad and doing our little gigs here and there. And um, that's kind of how this all started. And then, of course, you know, by hook and by crook, discovering, you know, Sonny Rollins and Joe Henderson and, like I said, Wayne Shorter. And then going back and discovering Colin Hawkins and Stan Getz and, like, you know, a lot of the swing guys, Don Bias. You know, I, I went through periods of time where I was a, a real sort of, like, student. And Johnny Griffin, of course who was a huge influence on me. Um, uh, so, you know, I guess that's, you know, I'm, I'm sorry that I'm kind of going into very oh. big detail about all of this stuff, but um, that's, that, that's in, in essence, my musical journey. That, that was the, that was the sort of like, you know, uh, genesis of, of, of who I am today. That was the, the first seed. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, kind of to piggyback on that, could you talk about like, so how you take all of these influences and all of this inspiration and then come out after a few years with your own distinct musical voice. Um, could you have any advice for how to do that for like a young jazz musician? Yeah, I, I you know, it's, it's interesting because I, I think that that's I think that question is it's a little bit misleading because I, I think I think, you know, critics always talk about, oh, how, how does how does someone come up with their original voice? And I feel, my opinion is that it doesn't happen all of a sudden one day. It, it's, um, you know, for me, it happened through a long period of imitation. And then, uh, you know, Clark Terry talks about imitation, assimilation, innovation. Um, and that kind of thing where um, you, um, you just play and play and play and play, you know. And I, I never really thought about it consciously. It's a, I think it's a subconscious pro uh, process where you know, you learn the language, you listen a ton, you fall in love with the music, you, you know, you find your peers that are interested in playing with you and you learn standards and then you write songs and you go on the road and you do, do local gigs. And, and it's that, and you do some really bad wedding gigs and like you have your experiences and you live your life. And as a result, the, I think the older you get, the wiser you get, the more life experience you get. Um, and, you know, if you're dedicated to hopefully getting a little bit better every day, um, that's the path towards it. There's not really one thing where you say you, you decide on one day, oh, I'm going to be original. <laughs> you know, it just right, doesn't, right. it just doesn't happen that way. It's, it's the gestalt or the totality of your experience that goes into, um, whatever expression that you end up coming to. So, you know, I mean, you know, some, I would say, you know, some great artists are not necessarily, the most original i mean it's always great when you see a thelonious monk or a john coltrane i mean there are those examples or a louis armstrong or charlie parker i mean there's those extreme examples of of people who really changed the way everyone thought about the music but not everyone's going to do that and i'm certainly not one of those people that's going to do that but i but i do feel like um you know i feel like i i'm still you know it's so cliche to say i'm a student of the music but i still kind of do feel that way you know i i really love this music so much i love the vocabulary of this music 
Um, I love that I can utilize this vocabulary to say what I want to say to people. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm at, the, at, the, at this point in time, I'm more able to look inside myself and let my vocabulary serve my own purposes than I used to be. I'm, I'm not as much of a clone as I used to be. Um, so it takes time, you know, it just, it just takes time and, and distillation. You know, the, like I said before, the older you, I get, the more I want to get to an essential uh, feeling when I play and not, and not just sort of be verbose and just say, Hey, look what I can do. You know, that's, that's kind of the, what young jazz musicians do. Hey, look what I learned. I look what I can do. And that's, that's sort of like the, the depth of it. But then as you get older, you realize that all of that stuff is just a mean, it's just a means to a greater end that you, you're utilizing what you've learned to tell your story and to really look inside. You know, one of my great, one of my great inspirations is Charlie Hayden. And I I'll, oftentimes I'll have my students do this, this Charlie Hayden exercise, uh, Charlie Hayden, the great bass player with Ornette Coleman. Um, I, when I was about 21 years old, I went to the Village Vanguard to see Josh Redman play with Billy Higgins, Charlie Hayden, and 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 uh, um, Pat Metheny, and they recorded some stuff that ended up on being on this record, Wish, including this solo that I saw live on this blues called Blues for Pat. And when when the record came out, first of all, I was psyched. I was like, I was there. I saw this happen, you know. And then, but then I I started listening to the record, and I remembered this one solo from that evening, and it was Charlie Hayden's solo on this blues. And they come way down and Pat, you know, comps this really spooky, beautiful comp behind Charlie. And Charlie plays this incredibly patient gem of a solo that just has everything in it that you want to hear. And so wise and so, you know, considered and graceful and deep and bluesy. And I mean, it has everything in it. And so I started thinking to myself, you know, why, why do I like this solo so much? And I, I started u- utilizing it as an exercise with my, with my students where... I would say, let's listen to the solo and let's pretend that we're Charlie Hayden, even though we're saxophonists, we're going to pretend that we're Charlie Hayden and we're going to, we're going to inhabit his space um, and see if we can let some of his wisdom rub off on us and, and, and let some of that feeling of, of patience and feeling of, of sort of, um, you know, uh, uh, pacing where, where you're not just giving everything away in the first four bars. So, you know, those kind of things where I look at to my elders and I look to people like Dewey Redmond and Charlie and, and, you know, like I said before, going even before that Lester Young and guys like that, where, um, you know, you really feel the essence of the music and beyond technique, it's, it's, it's something deeper than that. And that, that's what I'm really trying to shoot for now. And it's, you know, it's, it's an ongoing, it's a work in progress, as they say. <laughs> so. Yeah, I like everything you said. I really relate to, like, I don't know, the the things you learn end up serving your own musical voice over time. And I think you can't really escape your own musical voice. I think it yeah. shows itself the more and more you do it. Well, I think I think you have to be honest with yourself, too, as, as a musician. I mean, I, you know, if I'm honest with people about my influences and, and what I like, I mean you know, you'll, you're, you're not going to catch me every day just listening to jazz either. I mean, I grew up listening to Stevie Wonder and Bill Withers and, and, and James Taylor and, and Aretha Franklin and, you know, all of these and Isaac Hayes and all, all of these other, you know, the Beatles and the Stones and, you know, I mean, there's a Steely Dan, you know, there's, there's all of these other influences in there. Um, and, and also singers, you know, I mean, we never talk about vocalists, but, but vocalists have played such an incredible role in my life. Um, you know, I talked about Jane Monheit before, but, but also, you know, Anne Hampton Calloway and Freddie Cole and Dina DeRose and, you know, um, Janice Siegel and uh, um, um, Lauren Kinnan and, and Peter Eldridge. And, and I mean, there's so many singers that I've played with over, over my career, and I learned something from all of them. Um, and I, even with my students, I say, let's play like a singer. Let's pretend that we're singers. We're not just horn players pressing buttons. We want to, we want to sing to people. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, I mean, I have, I love, I love Abby Lincoln so deeply. I love Shirley Horn so deeply. I love Billie Holiday so deeply. I mean, those are, those are some of the most important people to me. I love Donny Hathaway so deeply. Um, you know, uh, Billy Eckstein, you know, I mean, I could, I mean, I could talk about this for another two hours if you want to just talk about singers, but, but, you know, that's the thing is that, is that all of these people that were just so brilliant and so soulful, um, those are my inspirations. And I, and I, and, and I guess what I'm getting at is, is that it's not just, it's not just a technical exercise to learn how to play jazz. You want to gravitate towards the stuff that opens up your heart. You know, I, I got to meet Bernadette Peters a while ago, um, and, and uh, I was at Birdland, and I was playing with um, 
I think it was Surreal M.A., another great vocalist. And, and, and she was there. And, and uh, I saw her in the audience. I saw the red hair. And I was like, oh, my God, that's got to be Bernadette Peters. And so, and I'm a huge fan. And I went up to her. There are other people greeting her. And, and I said, Miss Peters, I, I, I just have to tell you one thing. I said, um, first of all, it's a pleasure to meet you. Second of all, um, when I really need to unlock my heart, and I feel like I'm, I'm I feel like I'm cold and, and, and calculating in my playing, I listen to you sing Not A Day Goes By, and, and it just unlocks something. And it's just the, the emotions just, it's like a big catharsis for me. And she held my hand and she gave me a kiss and I could have died. I was just <laughs> like, oh my God, this is the greatest moment ever. But you know, I mean, but she, she's really important for me because she provides that for me. You know, that, that's one of those tunes that provides that for me, you know, j- listening to Jimmy Webb sing Wichita Lineman solo provides that for me, or listening to Donny Hathaway sing You've Got a Friend by Carole King provides that for me. You know, there are, there are certain things that I listen to that really just, it's like, it's like a little key that goes into my heart and turns and all of a sudden just things pour out. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's something that we, as musicians, we have to pay attention to, that it's not just about accumulating licks it's about you know what are you what do you have to say what like what what's inside you that you're hiding <laughs> you know yeah. um it's like it's like nick drake says open wide the hymns you hide you'll find renown while people frown you know it's just yeah. it's so it's that's so amazing you know it's another person nick drake and everyone should listen to nick drake but anyway um so that's the thing is that i really i'm trying to get closer to my emotions as i get older i'm trying to really honor my heart and not just my head, you know, because I spent a lot of years saying, Hey, look how clever I am. I'm not interested in that anymore. Mm. You know? So, yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. That's something I, I feel like the pandemic helped me with. Cause like I was finishing up my masters and I was like writing all this, I was doing my composition masters, writing all these big band charts and like trying to play the best stuff and just like scrambling and then I had a year to like actually think about what I love in music yeah and I think, yeah I'm well that's great yeah I mean and that's that's that a gift you know that yeah. yeah I think that's wonderful I mean that's a that's a gift you to be to be able to reflect upon that kind of thing and have the time to reflect on that kind of thing and ask yourself what is important to me musically I mean and obviously even just greater than musically but what you know you can ask yourself that question what do I really like what really turns me on you know and that and those are the things that we should be running towards and if it's not jazz then it's not jazz you know what I mean yeah. it might be something completely else you know and that's okay you know so I I, I really you know I have I, I have so much music that I that I love listening to, I and mean, I love listening to Beethoven. I love love listening to Devo. You know, I mean, it's just like there's a lot of stuff. You know, it's a lot of different things that I really, really love. You know, Todd Rundgren, I love. You know, so I mean, it's just it, it could be anything, but but I, I really want to run towards um, those things that that speak to my heart. That's that's the thing. Absolutely. Well, um, I kind of want to shift now to talking about like what's coming up for you. I know we talked about your album release, and you also mentioned a big move to Nashville in July. Could you talk right. about that? Sure. Um, well, you know, after I gave up my apartment, apartment in New York and I, I had been, uh, you know, living up here in Connecticut with my folks, um, I was trying to figure out what my next move was, was going to be. And I had considered I'd considered going out to California for a while. I was thinking about moving to San Diego. Um, I have friends out there that were kind of encouraging me to encouraging me to come out there. And then I started looking at rents in San Diego and I was like, yeah, I don't know. It's going to be as expensive or more expensive than where I was. And then um, I, I actually have a friend who's an opera singer in, in, um, in uh, Nashville who I know because she used to sub at the Met. She used to come up to New York City and, and we would hang out and she was always on call for the Met, you know, um, as, a, as a soloist. And and to play roles up there when she was you know, on call to do that. And so we became close and, and then um, she is from that area. So she moved back down to Nashville and we were talking on the phone one day um, earlier this year. And she said, you know, um, she said, I know that it, I don't know what the jazz scene exactly is like down here. She said, but I, I can tell you that every time I go out to see a gig and see a band play, the level of musicianship is incredible. And that kind of that kind of struck a note with me. I was like, wow. That's interesting that she would say that because I, I trust her opinion. And, and she was saying, yeah, you know, I, I would go out to hear different bands, a bluegrass band or a country band or a rock band or, or your jazz band, you know. And she said, you know, even though it's not as big of a jazz scene, obviously, as you're going to get in New York City, that, you know, the number and quality of musicians there is pretty, pretty great. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that sort of planted a seed in my head. And I thought, wow, Nashville, OK. 
that might be a possibility. And then I talked to the great saxophonist Jeff Coffin, and I started talking to other, you know, there's a um, great piano player who plays with Michael McDonald and Pat Coyle that lives down there. Um, mm-hmm. And everyone started saying, yeah, man, come down. I think you'll do really well. You know, I started, I talked to Rasan Barber, the great t- tenor player who's from there. Um, and everyone kind of said the same thing. They said, yeah, man, that sounds like a pretty, you know, sounds like a good idea. And so I, I said, screw it. I'm going to, I'm going to throw caution to the wind and I'm, I'm going to look for an apartment. And that's what I did. I looked, I started looking online, found a place. Um, and I'm, I'm just taking a chance basically. You know, I, I've been in New York for 31 years, had been in New York for 31 years. And this, you know, this pandemic sort of jolted me loose <laughs> and, um, I'm landing in a different spot, you know? Mm-hmm. It's like a, it's like, it's like a pool ball. Like someone, someone shot the cue ball at me and now I'm headed to another pocket, you know? That's really exciting. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. Well, yeah, I wish you the best in your move. I'm sure it's going to be amazing. Thank you. Thank you. I'm look, I'm really looking forward to it. I'm excited. I'm excited about it. Well, anyone who's got a question? Oh, someone. Oh, okay. Has- yeah. <laughs> uh, this is hi. Um, Joel, uh, and this was, you know, this is basically just my, First experience, uh, I had just gone to jazz school. This was JMU, James Madison. Uh-huh. Um, and, and you were on tour with Omar Avital. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I was just kind of wondering if you have, uh, you know, a memory of that tour, that show specifically. And I remember there was a soprano saxophone player and you guys had a really nice banter. Uh, I was wondering if, yeah, you remembered who that was because I knew it was you, but I can't remember who the soprano player was on that gig. Yeah, it was probably it was probably the great Israeli uh, saxophonist Eli de I, I I have a feeling that that's who that was uh, because we he that, that's the only soprano player that I can think of that toured with us at the time because otherwise it was always the trumpet player Avishai Cohen that was that was in that band with me. Um, so the one time that you saw with another saxophonist, which is pretty rare to see that band with another saxophonist. Uh, it was, I'm sure it was me and Ellie, Ellie DeGibri, most likely, um, who's an amazing, amazing musician, another great composer, another great improviser. Um, yeah, so that's, that's who that was, I'm almost certain. Awesome. Very cool, thank yeah. you so much. Yeah, you got it. <laughs> I think I'm getting that right. Awesome. Um, could you talk about like any dream projects or things you wanna do in the future that you haven't done yet that what would be awesome to do? Yeah, you know, my, you know, I'm, it's not so ambitious, but I've always wanted to, you know, I love Art Blakey and the Jazz Messengers very much. And I've always wanted to make a record, you know, in that style, not necessarily in that style, but with that formation, you know, with, with like, I'd love to make a record for like tenor trumpet and trombone and rhythm section. I've never really attempted it, you know, except for in school, they make you, <laughs> they make you arrange. <laughs> and I was always so scared of it, like, oh God, it's arranging. It's so hard, you know, but, but actually now I, I think I'd really like to write for more horns like i don't think i'm ever going to make a big band record but i but i love that particular setup like i like that sound a lot there's something really great and thick about about that sound mm-hmm. i mean and i know there are a lot of jazz bands out there like that but but still i think i think i would love to put my stamp on that particular type of writing at some point so yeah that's that's my dream i'd like to get a really good band together with two other horn players and write some more original music and just see what i come up with i think we would all like that too yeah <laughs> Um, I'll do some more rapid fire. Do you have any, I know we kind of talked about this, but do you have anything you're listening to or, I mean, even outside of music, like reading or checking out that you think we should all be checking out too? Um, yeah, of course. Now I, I'm, I'm not going to remember her name. I just, I just, I'm reading a, I'm reading a second book by a woman. Um, uh, she wrote this book called the Nightingale. I don't know if anyone's familiar with the Nightingale, but it's, it's, it's sort of, it's so, sort of like historical fiction. She, this, uh, I finished that one. I'm reading another one now. Uh, I wish I could remember her name. That's terrible. But, but, uh, the, the Nightingale is about, um, a woman and her sister in, in, in France during World War II. And they, uh, once one sister goes undercover to help, uh, allied forces get through the mountains uh, to freedom, you know, when, when they've landed in, in uh, the Vichy occupied uh, France and they're trying to, she's, you know, she's undercover as sort of a spy agent. And uh, so that was really good. I, I, I liked that. And, and um, I also read, oh, I also read um, this great, uh, oh, what is it called? The Life and Times of the Thunderbolt Kid, I think by Bill Bryson. Are you familiar with Bill Bryson? Oh man, that's a funny one. Yeah, I think it's called The Life and Times of the Thunderbolt Kid. It's something uh, to, along those lines. And this guy, this writer, Bill Bryson, is hilarious. And it's all about his childhood in the 50s. And it's, it's really, really funny. It's, it's, it's worth reading. So but yeah, that's, that's another author that I would, I would recommend. 
Um, and then just, you know, I've been rewatching Breaking Bad with my parents who never saw Breaking <laughs> Bad before. <laughs> So they're 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 into Breaking Bad and we you know and uh, you know so yeah there's there's a there's a few things and I and I've just been listening to lots of different music just going back and you know checking out I I, I actually just listened to Lee Morgan live at the Lighthouse last night with Benny Maupin and and uh, that was really great and um, yeah just rediscovering some old favorites you know Joe Henderson always Joe Henderson is always a good choice <laughs> yeah so. well I guess I'll end on like the question I ask everyone who I interview. Um, cause CCJA is a youth jazz organization mainly. And I always like to ask like what piece of advice you would give to a young musician who's just starting out and loves jazz and wants to maybe pursue this as a career. Well, I, I would say, I would say don't put too much pressure on yourself to, to think about, um, think about the, don't think necessarily about the career aspect of it at first. I think if you're, if you're a young musician, you should be having fun. You should be, you know, you, you should be at your instrument, whatever your instrument is, as much as you possibly can. This is a social music, and and this, that, that's what's made this last year so hard is that it, ha it hasn't been social. But if, if you're a young jazz musician and you want to get better and you want to learn how to play, you have to play with people and you have to go see the people play and listen to the records of the people that you love in order to learn and to get better. So the more you swim in this music and immerse yourself in this music and 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 go go put the brains of the people that you admire and then play with your peers and and work hard at it um but yeah keep your horn in your mouth keep the drumsticks in your hands keep the bass in your hands and and play as much as you possibly can because that's the way you're going to get better is is by playing not just by talking about it or 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 dreaming about it you know you have to you have to put your plan into action so play 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 music as much as you possibly can Absolutely. That's great advice. Uh, and listen and listen to music as much. We don't don't just don't and listen to lots of stuff that you don't know, too. I'm sorry. I had to put that in because oh, that, that's that's one of that's one of the things that young students forget to do. They forget to listen They you know, go and, and go down the rabbit hole and listen to as much music that you're not familiar with as possible mm -hmm. as well. That's my last that's my last word. Are there any final burning questions out there? Yeah, well, you know, I, I know I already asked one question. This one's just super quick. So, um, you know, you, you probably have gotten this about your work with the Saint Andrew Jazz Band in oh, Barcelona. Yeah. yeah. Um, I was just wondering if you wanted to talk maybe a little bit about how you got that gig, how it was to kind of go to Spain and work with that group of students and further, um, you know, how one kind of goes about fostering a music scene in maybe, you know, not to say there's not already a good jazz scene in Spain, but like, you know, working with young students, trying to get them invested, sort of trying to build a jazz education scene from the ground up, you know, sort of what's Joan Chamorro's maybe secret in ingredient. Sorry, that question was rambling, but yeah, no, no, I, you go. I, no, no, I know what you, I know what you're saying. And, and really you, you kind of answered your own question because Joan Chamorro is the reason behind all of that. And he, and it takes, my answer would be, it takes one person with that kind of passion and drive and they can change an entire culture and they can change the lives of you know hundreds of young musicians and that's what he's done and the, re the the way i got that gig was the great young trumpet player and, and singer andrea motis saw a video of me i think playing with surreal may and said said to juan said i want to play with this guy she didn't know me she, she said i want to play with this guy in this video and i remember i was at another gig i was in the lobby of a hotel and i get this phone call uh and it was a long just it was an international phone call and it says hey this is you know john chamorro you don't know me but um i'd like you to come in and play with my student band i said okay you know i had i had zero clue who he was or how the depth of this program and then i went over and those kids just blew my mind completely i mean as soon as i started rehearsing with these guys i said what is going on here this is really just i've never seen another student jazz program like that and i don't think there is another student jazz program like that it's really very remarkable but but yeah my answer is that if you you know for people that want to develop jazz education in that way it takes an individual like that it takes an individual that cares about it that much and cares about his students that much and and is so dedicated and will go do anything for his students and that's 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 the way john is so i you know that's all i can say about that cool thank you for that joel this has been so awesome <laughs> Yep. That's the funny. only right way to end it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. 
for taking the time. It's been really just so much fun to talk with you and so Thanks, much. Thanks, Jamila. Nice. Thank you. Thanks for having me. This has been great. Thanks everybody for listening. Uh, just thank you so much for having me as a guest. This has really been a blast. Absolutely. Thanks.